The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Real-Time Data Pipeline Automation for Databricks. I'm Carol Gunst and I'll be the moderator today. Uh, if we could just go to the next slide, please. I want to introduce today's speakers. We've got Dan Potter, VP of Product Marketing at Attunity, a division of Click. We've got Graham Heinbach, Business Development at Attunity, a division of Click and Jordan Marsh, Solution Architect with Databricks. Uh, as we, um, all listeners are in listen-only mode right now, so if you have any questions, please type them into the question portion of the, uh, the control panel, and we'll get back to your questions as soon as we can at the end of the broadcast. Next slide. And now let me turn it over to Dan Potter, who's going to talk about challenges today. Dan? Thank you, Carol, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk about data pipelines and how real-time data pipelines and automation is going to help overcome some of the real challenges that organizations are faced with as you're trying to prepare data sets for analytics. Uh, and if you think about some of the, the challenges that we've been faced with over the years uh, in solving these data pipeline automation challenges, the problem's only gotten much more difficult. Uh, particularly as you're fo uh, focused on AI and machine learning uh, data science initiatives where you're bringing in lots of heterogeneous data at big volume. So automating the transformations uh, becomes absolutely essential. Uh, how do you provision analytics ready data to your data scientists, to your citizen data scientists, and to your, your business analysts so they can start to extract the insights from this data? Uh, one of the big challenges that, that we'll talk about and you'll see is how do you handle this at scale? And in particular, with the machine learning data sets, very rich, deep, large uh, data sets and streaming in real time. Um, this is what the business requires. These are some of the, uh, the, the challenges, especially as we start talking about uh, moving to the cloud and multi-cloud. So you've got data uh, on-prem, you've got data that is cloud-born, you've got data that's being moved in real time to, to multiple clouds. Uh, how do I handle that in a seamless fashion? And finally, how do I make sure that our business users are never going to see inconsistent data? Making sure that the data as it lands into the cloud is transactionally consistent and making sure that we bring together uh, asset transaction support uh, as we're moving this data and loading this data. So these are some of the challenges that we're faced with. Again, trying to, to solve the, the business issue of how do I deliver the right data in the right format so business users and data scientists can get the insights that they need. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna talk about today and what you'll see in the demonstration uh, is a joint solution from Attinity and Databricks. The, uh, I'm sorry, Graham, you can go to the next slide. So the, the solution here, it's all about automating streaming data pipelines. How do we pick up changes to tr core transactional source systems, move those in real time, uh, and deliver analytic ready data into the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform and make this data available for machine learning, AI, and data science projects. Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. We've got uh, a lot to show you in the demo uh, later in the session. But now I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan to talk a little bit about Databricks. Jordan? Thanks, Dan. And I wanted to do a shout out to a lot of old friends from this group. I know there's a lot of folks that we've connected with over the past couple of years. So what we have at Databricks is a platform that it not only engages across all of the cloud today, but in a powerful way combines the user experience of being able to take your data, combining the data science activity that you want to achieve using Spark, which I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of, but then maybe you haven't heard about Delta Lake and Delta, the technology that we were open sourced at the last Spark Summit a little over a month ago. There's also the aspect of ML Flow. And what this gives you is a unified experience for all 2000 customers that we have to be able to take their big data that they need to process, have that asset that Dan was talking about to combine it, and let's say hypothetically, you wanna be able to process data, go back in history and understand what changed, how, what inside the data is skewing and causing that change, what inside your codes changed, all that experience is built in. I'm happy to show you that. 
As we go to the next slide, what we're going to talk about are some of the user experiences we have with many of our 2000 customers. As you can see from this inventory, you've got a number of different high tech and very um, powerful use cases that are happening to every industry that you can think of. As you go to the next one, because we're thinking about it from all the different user experiences, you can look at it for who and what. And I think this is somewhere where I want to detail all the opportunities. Because as you're combining and you're shopping and maybe getting some of your coffee in the morning and working with your bank and then going and buying groceries, all of those user experiences are driven using Databricks processing that data. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are processed using the, these technologies. And being able to take that personalized experience and give your customer, now that I've unified them, I've understood them, the tagging of that customer, the experience, and then making sure that when you're delivering that inventory and that pricing and the actual digital experience that's changing the way that we do not only purchasing, shopping, and engagement with our customers, those are parts of how advertising and tech have taken on uh, Databricks and used it all over the place. Secondarily, we really specialized to start when we took it to a vertical in genomics and the health and life sciences. So we went after as hard of a problem as we could possibly find. And some of the leaders in that space use us to process their genomics so that your user experience when you're looking at it from a personalized medicine standpoint. And also when you're talking about personalized, that's also taking in how it affects you as also the population is affected as well. So that includes the sensors that scan you and collect your blood types and information around you, how we process and understand and detect cancer from an image and how we're able to look at each one of the different systems that's monitoring us and combine that user experience. Further, there's also just the aspect of I'm a provider and I help you when you go to the doctor to pay certain claims and process them. Further, you can hear about us in the oil and gas space, helping out supply chains and being able to figure out what's the best place to pick up oil and gas, helping them to figure out their marketing. Then further, you can think about how we buy today. Big data was driven starting by Google, but all of our customers are expecting that not only the instantaneous search at the business level, but the way that they take in and understand the way that their customers are interacting with them. And then lastly, some of the biggest use cases we'll talk about with Delta are driven in the security use cases. Please go to the next. And when we took, talk about that, it's also covering like risk, right? How credit cards and other systems that we use to be able to, to validate and make sure that we're protected. So when we take on these toughest, the, some of the toughest challenges for your data teams, if we go to the next, we can then look at, we can look at the problem itself. When you look at the problem, the scale of this, right? So I've been in the big data space of my, all of my career dealing with problems of like setting up the infrastructure. I mean, one of my use cases I ha or experience that lived it where we it took us like nine months to install the hardware and software to get it all up and running in a year long project. That gives you only three months to do any of the different data collection analysis and barely even enough time to start feature engineering, ML, machine learning and data verification. All those things that you really want to do. So very few use cases get to that, but Databricks separates that uh, itself in that way where your experience is very quick with all of these uh, white boxes and get you into that green machine learning quickly. Go to the next. And when we're doing this, what we're looking at is, is dealing with those technical debt scenarios. So it's all the systems that you want to connect today, like your Hadoop or your um, operational ERP living in Oracle, your, your enterprise data warehouse. But bring all those systems to Yes, on Azure, all landing in these parquet files, being able to take and combine and merge customers and emails, videos, sensors, and clickstream into these tools that you hear about, right? You have these desktop tools and the data science that we're learning, whether you're using Coursera or any platform out there, you can use Scikit. And then all of a sudden you get into deep learning with tensors and, and Keras and PyTorch and even using MSNet. So you can combine that user experience. Let's go to the next. And that data engineering and data science that we're combining is introduced in what we call the unified analytics platform. What it takes is your big data and your machine learning. In the core of it, our backbone partners in the platform, such as Azure and Amazon, we spin out containers using our underlying infrastructure to elastically scale. I describe this as like the next generation of technologies that you think about from like MPPs and other big data tools to really be able to scale and use what you need to scale out and process that data. That's the underlying runtime and cloud service. 
within that runtime, you can use those ML frameworks I just talked about, and you can land those files into Delta. And you have this incredible user experience for being able to trust the transactions that come in, process the scale of petabytes of data, and be able to run machine learning. I mean, this promise was something we've always discussed. And now, I mean, I'm biased because I work here, but this we really are delivering that in a notebook experience that allows you to take and operationalize these processing data sets in a very productive and powerful way. Go to the next. And as we do this, we take in what is called the Delta Lake process. So Delta Lake is an open source project that we've uh, brought to market. And it takes the common storage vehicle that we have, Parquet files, and it appends two files to it. One that addresses the transaction log and another one that gives you indexing statistics. This is built on top of the cloud storage like S3 and ADLS, but it was designed so that our compute and storage are combined with the Spark so that it's a, your operational data stores can be streaming all the time. And this is built on technologies that you know today, like the file type parquet using open standard data sets. So one of the biggest releases of Spark Summit was that open source. And I think what we'll do today is detail what that means for you when you're trying to make sure everything comes in in real time and all of your analytics and predictions are real time. Let's go to the next. When you take Delta, you wanna make sure that the data is reliable. You wanna make sure that it's enforced that the streaming, the actual parquet files that are coming in, whether they're batched in in big groups like your operational customer data to the way people are clicking on your website and also then being able to make sure that the right ID comes in. You don't wanna handle for those duplicates. That's where we get into these features like acid transactions. And what you're able to do is to update and delete the data and also just the resolution, right? That's where ACID comes in. And this also enforces that if the systems change, and knowing a bit about Attunity from the past, when you take in the schemas that could change underneath, like databases are updated, the Delta system of processing these files will change with it. So Attunity and Databricks together allow you to never have broken data sets. So this allows you to have uh, oh, easy way to resolve that data and change it over time. As you do this, you wanna be able to update the data and process that. And then maybe in our other concept, which I'll go to the next slide and talk about, is we'll end up having what we call time travel. And that time travel gives you back a process that allows you to go back at a point in time. Let's say your CFO gets a report and he sends down the email and says, what changed in our underlying data? You can use ML flow to understand the statistical variance. Maybe you look at some of the significance of change there and you can understand based upon accuracy scores and those tools to understand where that's changed. And you can then take the data version that you have using that transaction log on the screen here to be able to take that as a, as a hypothetical way of looking at what changed at points in time to look at uh, in machine learning, we call it experimentation to address those problems. This then takes you into the compaction which is another aspect of loading data sets and caching. And what's important to note is that when you bring in large amounts of data, each day of the week, you're gonna land a new file. And then within that, if you start to multiply hours, month, day, year, and even down to minutes and seconds, you're gonna take small files and need to resolve them back into a much larger file and database. That compaction process is called the merge functionality. We do that in an automated fashion will then optimize that data for the caching within the distributed backbone of a cloud infrastructure. And we'll take in and we'll even skip data sets. Like if we're gonna be processing data and you wanna filter by dates and times, you wanna be able to have an optimized filter that looks at that and manages the way that those data, that data is collected using Spark. Let's go to the next slide. As you do this, you're gonna be using your our collaborative workspace to be able to help your ability to like configure, put jobs into production, and in one click, be able to have that user experience. Further, that process of cycling to see if a job completed, right? Let's say the job took like 10 minutes or 20 minutes and you're sitting there watching it run. You wanna be able to have the interaction with the notebook that takes you into the logs and says, okay, this is broken here or this is broken there. I can stop the job and I don't have to wait 10 minutes to cycle. 
Our interactive UI that takes in the Databricks file system gives you that combination experience so that you're in real time debugging production operations, looking at how your code's gonna be look, working. And just like you have in like different tools such as uh, Word or Google Docs, that user experience of being able to click in and see how other people are interacting, you can also see how the code is changing if someone's changing and editing that user experience. Let's click more to get more of the parts of the slide. So these interactive notebooks can be coded together where I can take in and code in Spark SQL, in R, Scala, and Python, which means I can port existing like Jupyter or Zeppelin tools that you're using today to take those systems and run it against that underlying process to see not only the speed of execution, that's one of the common use cases for working with Databricks, but there's also the user experience of taking in your graph analytics, your machine learning, your deep learning, and exposing that and looking at what the outputs are using ggplot or D3 tools that are built into the underlying UI. And these dashboards give you that interactive experience of seeing the velocity of your data, understanding how I build that out. And that interactive experience gives a very frictionless collaboration to then iterate on my code, process that, and understand how I want to use it. Let's go to the next. And as we're doing that process, that feedback loop can take multiple clusters or just a single one that we're using today to understand how to process that data set. So what I'm gonna do is pass this back to Dan and we can go from there. Thanks guys. Thanks Jordan. So what I'm gonna do now is give you a little bit of backdrop about Affinity, how we fit and what the value of the joint solution is. Um, Affinity is a vendor that we, for the better part of the last decade, uh, we've really been leading uh, in streaming change data capture, in helping organizations move data in real time in a very efficient way and unlock data from their core transactional systems. Uh, these can be relational databases, these can be mainframe systems, SAP, uh, data warehouses, unlocking this data, picking up the transactions uh, as as they occur and moving them in real time. And more and more over the last decade, it's about, been about moving the data into the cloud. Uh, we are the leading cloud migration technology. Uh, we've moved over 120,000 uh, databases into the cloud, both Attunity and, and our partners. Um, so we, we have a, an architecture and change data capture that is really well suited for moving just the deltas uh, into the cloud. Uh, and the way in which we do it, and, and you'll see that if we stop rambling and get into the demo shortly, you'll see uh, the agility and the user experience uh, and how we've made uh, what in the past would have been a manually intensive, very cumbersome process of, of, of executing this. We've made it uh, very, very easy uh, through a modern UX and, and made it uh, drag and drop uh, by prepackaging all of the automation and shielding the complexity. Next slide. So the Attunity pipeline solution, uh, it's about first generating change data streams. Change data capture has been around for a while. Done right, and we do it right, change data capture, it's a non-invasive way that you can pick up the changes to these systems. Uh, it's non-invasive in that uh, I don't need to install agents on these machines. Uh, very low footprint, very low impact to the source systems. Uh, you know, you contrast that to a traditional ETL where I'm doing batch processing uh, in a certain window because uh, the impact that it causes to production systems. Change data capture is, is different. Non-invasive change data capture generates these change streams and we're continuously moving this data and delivering this to the cloud, into data lakes, data warehouses, other databases. So three of the core use cases in building out pipelines for us, the, the most simple one is database to database replication. This was a traditional data pipeline that, uh, that you probably have in house and you've probably been doing for the better part of, uh, you know, since there were more than one databases uh, in your organization. Uh, data warehouse automation and data lake automation, these are really the core use cases uh, in support for modern analytics initiatives. And it's these modern analy analytic initiatives like machine learning and AI that's been driving modern data architectures like cloud data warehouses and Databricks. Now, how do we help move data into the cloud? How do we refine that data and make it uh, available for analytics use? This is what Attunity is all about. 
So this, this modern analytics uh, and modern data infrastructure has required a change in how data in, is, is integrated and moved. And that's really what the Utility Platform is all about. It's providing a, a way that we can access data from those core source systems once in a very efficient way and deliver it where and when it's needed uh, in an analytics-ready data set. On the next slide, again, you want to have a single solution, ideally, that will span all of the different sources and all of the different targets. Right? We talked about the different use cases moving to data warehouses, to data lakes. So you need uh, to unlock the sources, and you need to have a lot of different targets. Uh, this is where Attunity shines as well. A unique uh, differentiator for us is, is our broad support uh, across various sources and targets. Um, the sources on the bottom here, as you can see, uh, span everything from mainframe systems, databases, uh, cloud data sources. And the targets can be you know, a, a cloud object store. The target can be another database. Uh, if the target is a data warehouse or a data lake, uh, Attunity not only delivers that data in real time, but we also structure that data and make it ready for analytics. And that's where Attunity and Databricks really shine. So, Grant, if you jump to the next two slides, uh, we'll talk about how we apply the streaming data pipelines uh, into Databricks for an end-to-end -end solution. So, you know, first we're capturing those those transactional changes. So change data capture will we'll capture those. Uh, we'll uh, move them directly into Databricks Delta. Uh, what makes uh, Attunity and Databricks Delta such a, a unique combination? Databricks Delta is perfectly suited. The name Delta is all about these changes. How do I efficiently handle and process these changes? So we, uh, in providing change data capture, uh, we're moving those deltas uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, we generate the Spark transforms uh, so that we can do this continuous ingestion and merging uh, to create a superset of data, the full change history. And from that, we can derive purpose-built analytic subsets of data. Uh, it may be a historic data store. It may be an operational data store, a real-time view. It may be a snapshot. Um, so having this this end-to-end -end pipeline where Attunity picks up those changes, uh, we process and push push down that processing into Databricks, and we develop the analytics-ready data sets that your data scientists and citizen data scientists are looking for. Uh, again, we're kind of moving people out of the uh, hand coding, uh, the manually intensive, the added risk, the added cost to full end-to-end -end automation and making it resilient. Jordan touched on this where you know, we pick up not only the, the changed data, but we pick up the changed metadata as well on those source systems. And this this end-to-end -end pipeline is resilient to change, to metadata change on the source system. So we pick it up, we automatically apply those changes, and we make uh, those data flows uh, continually available. So on the next slide, the real value here to organizations is that you know, having this, this streaming real-time pipeline and automating everything from change data capture ingest straight through to analytics-ready data, this is what you really need to, to strive for if you're going to meet those business demands. You want to be able to get those insights uh, from the data in your data lake. You need to do it in a very efficient manner. You want to be able to provide real-time data, uh, continuous data at scale. You have data and processing that's happening in most organizations and most large organizations across a multi-cloud environment and hybrid environment. Uh, and again, you want to make sure that any data uh, that the users are, are, uh, are viewing uh, is transactionally consistent. Uh, so making sure as we land the data and as the data is processed in, in Databricks, that we're providing that, that transactional consistency uh, that provides the trust and confidence of the business users. So this is the value. Uh, I'm now going to turn it to Graham so you can see the solution in action. Graham, you want to take over? Cool. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate it. Um, let me jump out of this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I didn't put slides together. I thought I'd just jump right back to the demo. So I'm on uh, Microsoft Azure. I have uh, Databricks. Um, cluster up and running and available. 
Um, I've also got a virtual machine running uh, up in Azure, and this is where I'm going to run uh, Compose and Replicate, which are the uh, Replicate is the change data capture engine, and Compose is the uh, the data delivery engine as part of the uh, Attunity platform. So what I wanted to show is I've already run some components. Um, here I can see that my cluster is running. Um, if I take a look at my uh, data, you can see I've got a Northwind landing area and the Northwind operational data store. And we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but again, if I take a look at one of my SQL notebooks, I can take a look at the landing area. So I've already preloaded some data into Northwind landing customer. Um, and we're going to show a sh slowly changing dimension table and changes to that uh, to that table. So we've got a, a a customer. Her name's Maria, and we're going to change some data with uh, with Maria. So if I alt tab over to my virtual machine, here's my application. So I have a, an application. I, I can change customer information, and we can see it's set to Maria James, same as the initial load um, of the data inside of uh, Delta. Um, if I take a look at Replicate, here's Replicate running. We have our designer mode uh, where we have our source, our MySQL source, and then our, our uh, Azure Databricks Delta target. Um, I can take a look at employees just by simply double clicking on the object um, inside the GUI. And we can take a look at transformations. So full support for disparate schema. I might have columns in the source that I don't want to propagate to the target because of PCI, um, or I might want to concatenate first name and last name and create a new column. So we can do stuff like that. Um, same with parallel load. So inside of Expression Builder, um, I could create a transformation, create a new filter. If we could add a column, take a quick peek here, call it a new call. Let's take a look at Expression Builder. So I can augment and add to Expression Builder. So here's my initial columns. If I want to get at the header information of the transaction, um, any specific operations, if I've got a logical operation or a mathematical operation, and then functions. So my, I might want to create a, an SHA-256 of the value, or even create a user-defined function. So we, uh, you can add C and C++ libraries either on Windows or Linux, and we give you documentations and library stubs to do that. So I've got customers doing 256-bit triple DES encryption of the data on the wire in flight, and we support that as well. So what I've done is I've run this process, and I can jump from designer mode to monitor mode, and we see that we've loaded uh, some of the tables into Delta, and it's sitting here waiting in change processing mode. So what do we need to do next? Let's take a quick look at Compose. So here's the monitor situation for Compose. It knows about a Replicate. It knows that this process is running. Um, and we also ran this initial load, and I can see we were successfully loaded data a couple of minutes ago. It's a, a completed. If I jump into designer mode um, for Compose, basically we need the metadata. So Northwind Landing, we can take a look at the MySQL source and say, yep, test the connection to make sure we have all the metadata information about the tables that we want to replicate in near real time over to, to Delta. And it says it's successful. And also we have a, then a connection um, to Delta Lake um, so that we can send, uh, as uh, Dan said, uh, Spark SQL um, or Spark Jobs over to Delta Lake to process that, uh, that data for us. So what Compose is doing is it's doing that extract, load, and then transform capability. So I've got my landing and storage connections. And if I look at the storage zone, and we say, let's take a look at uh, Northwind MySQL. Here's a list of tables and we've, we've automatically mapped them. So if I double click on employees, we'll see that we're gonna create a, a map statement between uh, the employee MySQL to the target landing area. So it's taking a look at the metadata from the source and target and saying, okay, let's take a look at all the different columns that we have and say, yep, we know that employee ID matches employee ID. We know that last name equals last name and so on and so forth. And you can change these mappings, add new entities. We could change the view of it. We can also define auto mappings. But what I wanna show is what's happening under the covers. So if I turn around and come over to the MySQL CDC component, and I say, let's take a look at employees here and we look at the task commands. So as you can see, it's all drag and drop. I didn't have to create any code. I didn't have to deal with, with Spark SQL. I didn't have to deal with Scala. But if I say let's do an update on the tables categories, we build the SQL for you. You can change it. So we're running the Delta Lake merge command. So what we're gonna do is write to a set of base tables and then write to a set of change tables in the landing area and then create the operational data store. So we can take a look at that right now. So if I pop back over here for a second. Let's take a look at our data. So here's my landing area and here's my customers. So inside this is all capabilities uh, from, from Delta Lake. 
So here's Maria James. So she's one of our sales representatives. And if I also take a look at the change table for customers, uh, we'll see that's blank. So we've created the initial load, but there's no sample data. So what I'm going to do to drive this data into Delta Lake is come back over here, come back over to my Northwind application. So we'll take a look here at replicate. It is in change processing mode. Here's our customers. There's no inserts, no updates, no deletes. So if I go to Northwind customer, let's change Maria's name. So Maria happily got married. And she's going to change her name to Mr. Anders. We'll say save changes. I can come back over here. So this is real time writing. I'll hit back, writing to that MySQL database. So now it's Maria Anders. If I look at replicate, we picked up that change in real time. So as soon as that was written to the MySQL database, could be Oracle, could be SQL Server, could be DB2, the 35 different source platforms that we support. And that data has been written over. So again, if I alt tab over, take a look at my data inside of Delta Lake, and I take a look at my customer CT, my change table. I look at the customers, customer CT. Cool, so it's empty, so I need to move it over. And the way I move it over is using Compose. So if I pop over to Trinity Compose, we are gonna run, a bit of monitor, this job. And the job is the CDC job, to take it from the staging area and then move it over to the base table. So I'm gonna say, all right. So let's take a couple of seconds. We'll get a list of all our tables. So as you can see, the deltas will be picked up or the change of that processing. Um, the way I can look at it is I have a MySQL or a SQL Workbench um, application. We're gonna use JDBC to connect over to uh, like, so say, okay. And what I wanna look at is, here's my show the partition information. So we've partitioned this data set for every 60 seconds or every minute. So we've created a partition. And since I've run this uh, demo a couple of times before, we should be able to list, we have a partition table that we can take a look at. There you go, we have all that information. Now let's take a look at the CT customers to see if that data was sent over. Cool, so we have the before image and the after image. So the before image we have, there is Marie James and she changed her last name to Anders. And since that is available, I can also pop over, oh, I've got an error condition, we'll come back to that. But I can come back over to my, um, sorry, to my Delta Lake environment and say, take a look at the data, take a look at employees, as my, my, my customers, sorry. And we have Marie uh, Ames. And then if I take a look at data again, and look at the change table, scroll down here. Excellent, we also have the before and after image. So that data was propagated into Delta in near real time. So, and then what we do is we're gonna run that last job for compose and it's gonna use that merge command and merge the data set together. So if I pop back into my Northwind operational data store, and we take a look at our, our customers, we have a, this is a subset of all the data. But if I take a look here, we can see we have all those base uh, columns have been sent over to that operational data store. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jordan. Um, that's it basically from, uh, from me for the demo. Any questions so far? Perfect, no, this is awesome, Graham. Perfect. All right, so let do you have me, a couple more slides? Let me share my screen. I'm gonna do a quick demo ah, okay. of the product. So this is the um, Databricks notebook that I'm gonna be showing today, but it's in my workspace. So in my workspace, I've got like a lot of different files. I got my whole team and you start here. And what I've got is a demo that I have on Delta. For this use case, I'm using Azure um, to process this. And I just click on this notebook. From there, I've set up a cluster that I call it the Jordan cluster right here. And so what I'm able to do is just attach locally to something that I've installed. But the goal of this exercise is to give you some overview of what Delta does, how the ETL process works, and how it interacts with the Databricks runtime. So on top of what Graham's shown you, I've got this example. He could be loading directly from Replicate into Kafka and then pulling and using that merge functionality using Delta um, there. So what Delta does is it puts this transaction layer on top of the blob storage. 
and it allows you to scale it. One of our key customers we talk about is Apple, and they're loading something like 300 terabytes a week, something huge. So it's massive scale, right? And it doesn't get any bigger because I've working with Attunity in the past. We've I've seen customers that have loaded like 40 petabytes of data, and they're loading into Hadoop. And I think what I describe Zookeeper is the as one of the technologies that's like the kid in the back seat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And what you want to make sure is that you don't have like that all that activity causes these small files and the activity to like increase all around the cluster. It really just overload the infrastructure. So Delta avoids that overall experience, handling the optimization, compactions, and, and details all on these cloud infrastructures. And whenever I process this, I'm going to start by running my first Spark job, and I'm going to show you running that. But since I ran this yesterday, I'm just going to go through the codes for the sake of time. Because what I'd like to do is open up. If people have questions, please put them in the chat as you're learning and you're looking at it. In this example, I'm using a Scala-based notebook and executing Scala code. And what I've done is I've run a Spark job yesterday that will overwrite some of this data and it will save it into this operation. So let's show you running a Spark job. So right here, I've opened up and I'm running each one of the different stages of Spark. And when I was showing you that the interactive UI can show you what's running at each one of the different intervals and how it's processing. This is unique for the Spark execution and gives you an incredibly powerful user experience. From here, I can then process each one of the Delta logs and you can see them, that they're all Parquet files. At the end of the day, when I format this, I'm gonna load this underlying data into Delta from there and process it. And we're gonna show you that Delta rocks right here. So Delta does rock. And I'm gonna use Spark SQL, that's where I override this command right here and show you further that using this count star, I can get 500 records of Delta rocking. And what I'm gonna do is, is show you some concepts that we have, which is part of the merge functionality. The merge functionality is doing some filtration, it, whether something is or isn't, and it's gonna be able to showcase you a new table. As we process that, we're running some Spark. We're gonna show you that Delta rocks. And what this does in the display, it starts at the bottom. And it's gonna show you that Delta is better than you would have ever thought, or at least it's gonna tell us that that's the case. So as we process this, what we found is those those processing takes a little, those processes take a bit of time. And using Spark SQL, we're able to look at this optimized command, which is going to review the way that files are being processed and grouped. And Spark really optimizes the underlying folder where all those files live. What we're gonna be able to do now is taking those 16 minutes, and we're gonna render this in one, in very short order. So by able to look at the data sets that are there, you can scan through and process them. And lastly, all those files, they may have been small files that need to be cleaned up. So what we do is we run the vacuum command, which is a, a way of taking in and processing the files and bringing them together. There's history on those files that are carried, so you can see whether an optimization or a merge or reading or writing occurred and all the history of the jobs at the point in time that I executed all those operations. So I can get full history using those transaction log details, and we can look at the Delta log itself. So this is a checkpoint file that takes in what's there. This is the header, and this is the transaction log. So it's another folder within the data that we're working on, all working on top of the Databricks file system that we've mounted to be able to process this data. Further, if you wanna look into one of these files, Actually, I need to change this because it's added another file. Let's do file 14. And as I process each one of these, it's showing all the different data sets that are mounted. So that's the key. Actually, I bet you I just added zero. There we go. So it shows me that in my commit log, counting zeros and causing myself error. But what I can show using Spark, the Catalyst engine, which is allowing you to understand how the file is distributed and what's part inside of there, gives you the predicates, the order buys, and the details of how the file's stored all in there and gives you all the change activity that occurred on those files. So this is my demo. And what I'm gonna do, Graham, is I'm gonna stop sharing and then sh convert to you. Or Graham, can you start showing, sharing? Yes, I just made Graham the presenter. 
Um, Perfect. I wish that was great. Yep. So yeah, let me take this moment to thank Dan, Graham, and Jordan for doing a great job presenting and demoing today. And um, as you might expect, we have some questions. So let's uh, let's take it from the top here. Uh, this first one is for Jordan. Um, is Delta Lake compatible with uh, ADLS, that's Azure Data Lake Storage, uh, Gen 2 or uh, only Gen 1? It's, it's absolutely compatible with Gen 2. So I was speaking, um, previously I worked for uh, Attunity, if you haven't gotten the gist, and we were at the Ignite show doing a joint presentation with the ADLS2 team showcasing loading using Attunity and using um, Databricks together. So yeah. All right. Uh, Jordan, I think this next question is for you as well. Um, is update delete functionality available today? Uh, the Delta IO site says it'll be coming soon. Yeah, so the open source, it is not. And I think what we can do is follow up with you offline on that one. Uh, but in Databricks, it is, like the actual runtime. All right, thanks. Commercial. All right, and I'll, I'll throw this out to uh, Dan Graham and Jordan. Um, a typical data lake question, uh, will Delta Lake help in uh, merging the Attunity created uh, underscore CT tables in Hive to the full load tables in real time? In the data Correct, yeah, Graham will, will, Graham will answer that one. Yeah, and that, that's what we're doing with Compose. So replicate creates our base table and our change table, and then Compose for, for Delta Lakes uh, takes that data, uses the merge command in Spark SQL, and merges those two to build a, a base table or an ODS, an operational data store, historical data store view of that merged uh, transactional table. Terrific. Thanks, Graham. Uh, can Attunity uh, handle semi-structured data sources? Um, Graham can answer that one as well. <clears throat> Absolutely, <laughs> depending on the object types. Uh, generally, we're looking for some form of schema-based uh, source system, but we have full support for replication of files, uh, pulling CSV or TSV objects and deploying them into the Delta Lake. Um, also full support for blob, clob, log. So anything that we can interact with uh, some form of RDBMS can be replicated to a target. Okay. Uh, here's another Attunity question. Uh, is the Attunity pipeline on FedRAMP level medium or high? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not a FedRAMP person. Uh, that would be something we definitely have to get back to you about. Right. As you know, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'd have to get back. Yeah. All right, here's another good question, question um, from the demo. I believe this is Graham's demo. Um, how do you test the output data to verify it's okay before sending to a data lake? Oh, very good. Good question. Um, lots of ability you can capture that data using uh, different tool sets. Uh, any JDBC compliant tool set will allow you to look at that data inside of Delta Lake. So that's that's one of the features. What Compose is doing is Replicate is writing to ADLS and it's, it's building uh, CSV file structures um, and then basically saying load that into Delta. Um, so Compose is not really doing uh, heavy lifting, it just allows you to graphically build that uh, extract load transform capability and we build that SQL for you. That SQL itself though is run on Delta. So any of the tool sets I was showing, um, SQL Workbench allows you to look at the data, verify the data. Also, we will have a, as part of AEM, Attunity Enterprise Manager, there is a verification uh, component that is currently in beta. Um, and of course the, uh, the object is to add Delta Lake um, as one of the targets so you can verify that the source and target data uh, that we've loaded is syntactically as well as uh, um, visually correct. Okay, and there was a follow-up question here then too. Uh, uh, how do you check on the lineage and values from source to target? Yep, very good question. So that's also part of, of AEM, Attorney Enterprise Manager, that we did not show today due to time constraints. But uh, if you want to leave us an email address or phone number, we can definitely follow up and uh, set up a, a private demonstration for you. Okay, we'll, we'll have that. Um, cool. Here's another Attunity question. Does uh, Attunity Replicate and Compose have to run on a VM or is there a container option in Azure? Oh, very good question. Yeah, so we've just pushed Replicate out for Docker. Um, so you could run it in Docker container in AWS and or Azure. Um, and then of course the, the goal is to allow Kubernetes to control that. So we're, that's in, uh, in R&D right now. All right. Thanks. Uh, this one may be for Jordan. Uh, can we do uh, AL and ML based data analysis 
by getting data directly out of the streams, um, i.e. this event sourcing platform in real time? Broadly, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm happy to show you a demo. <laughs> I, I heard a doggy in the background. Sorry, somebody needs to feed Good the dog. Yes. Dog needs out. Um, okay, so uh, typical data lake question. Uh, will Delta Lake help in merging the um, Attunity created CT? Oh, I think we asked that question. That one. Yeah, we took that one. And let's see. How about a high currency cluster Scala with Databricks? Are there any limitations? So there's limitations on the number of users, but you then just spin out multiple clusters. So it's not a limitation, it's just the way we configure it, right? We're used to the on-prem world ha having a, a fixed infrastructure of storage and nodes. In this new world, we call it serverless, right? So we have multiple clusters and we have lots of ways of helping you with sizing. The Databricks team has been doing that the whole, uh, we've really made it in our form. So if you want to connect with us, happy to like walk you through by use case, how to size. All right. Um, thank you. One last question here. Spark merge is not typically real time. How much latency would you say uh, is an industry standard? I'm happy to answer this one. Go ahead. Yeah, go um, so the industry standard, it's subjective to your users, right? But if you're looking at a, a streaming component tree so that like there's millisecond or, or a couple second delay, that's really, really performant, even for uh, financials and other applications that are out there, right? So um, when you make purchases and want to do fraud detection with your credit cards, this is the most efficient way to do it, right? It's not just reporting in analytics, it's apps that are driven off of these platforms. So absolutely happy to detail that further and, and um, could usually accommodate by scaling out the cluster to get to a much faster result. We've got such things as like the clusters in, in warm pools that are uh, available or spot instances as we call them where the, the nodes are already ready and sparks all in, in, in memory and processing data sets. Right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have today. If there's any we have missed, uh, we will go through the um, all the questions and get back to you via email. Wanted to just direct your attention to some additional um, content for follow-up. Um, Jordan, I think you put this up uh, for people, deltausers.slack.com um, is a place to go for more information. And um, on the Attunity side of things, we've got a book, um, Streaming St Change Data Capture, Mo Riley. And if you go to the uh, Attunity website, you can uh, download a copy at no cost to you. So we hope you uh, take advantage of that offer. Thank you everyone for your time today. And uh, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.